Okay, so today we'll start about um, talking about time series and forecasting. So this will only really touch the surface of what you can do with time series and uh, what's different in dealing with time series than with dealing with IID data as we did so far. So this is the last lecture of new material that will be included in the exam. So next week we'll do a little bit of a recap on Monday and then on Wednesday uh, my postdoc uh, Nicola will come and talk about recommender system. And then the week after that the exam is here on the Monday at the usual time. So first I want to talk about what might be the goals or what are the tasks that people uh, commonly have when working with time series data. And so actually a lot of the data that we see in applications is time series data and I think about half of my capstone projects that I mentored were involving some sort of time series data. Um, very common one is actually doing forecasting in 1D, which is you have a time series that is just a single number over a period of time usually in regular intervals and you want to continue this sequence into the future. So here this is the Mona Lua CO2 data set. This is the CO2 captured or the CO2 concentration captured on top of a volcano in Hawaii. Um, and these are I think uh, weekly measurements so we have um, one float every week since um, 1959 and um, so an example task could be learn a regression model that takes in the orange data as training set and then predicts in the future that might be interesting for us to learn what do we expect in terms of uh, CO2, co2 concentration in the future and this is something that's um, yeah uh, a very common task like do you want you want to extrapolate how many users will there be for a different product how many people will buy something um, and so on one thing you can see here is there's a basically two components there's a very clear upwards trend and there's uh, periodicity and we'll talk about them uh, in a little bit Give me one second oh no Oh, it is recording, but it just doesn't tell me it's recording. That's interesting. Okay. Um, another one is what I would call uh, ND forecasting. Oh, maybe coming back to this. I mean, one of the main things that's different here in, say, a regression problem as we looked at so far is um, that the data is not IID. So here in this example, you would have a single um, number which you can either think of as the input or as the target I mean maybe you could say the feature here is just the time the date and the target is Y and then this would be a 1D regression the difference is that the data is not IID and the things that we see in the future clearly depend on the things in the past and so there's a trend here and so particularly if you want to learn a model for this we need to take care in our model evaluation that we don't do say um, like a, train t a standard train test split that's randomized or k full cross validation because uh, we want to make sure that the way we split our data set respects uh, this time structure so we usually want to take the past or some part of the past as a training set and then validate on sort of the more recent past or the future So another task uh, is ND forecasting. That's, um, so here you would have multiple time series. So here I have the stock price of Google, Apple, and Microsoft. And um, the goal would be, could be either to forecast all of them at once or to forecast one based on the others. So here you, or you would try to model uh, each of them, you could model them, of course, individually, but you can also ex 
expect that there's some correlation between them. And so here you can, oh, you can, wow, I think this is the dot com bust, and this is the, uh, no, wait, this doesn't, this is too late for the financial market crash, right? Yeah, that was super nice. That was, that's here. This is the, yeah. this is the financial market crash. What is this? Yeah, I think it's a split, they split, right? But, but did both of them split at the same time? Doesn't matter. Okay. I, I know Google split, but why did Apple and Google split their stock at the same time? Doesn't matter. Anyway, so um, yeah, there's clearly some correlation uh, in these time series, and so maybe we can model them together. Um, but here, say, you don't have any of these for the next day. So, um, you want to make predictions today, what are they tomorrow or next week, and you don't observe any of them. There's also, um, you think of having more explanatory variables that you don't try to forecast. So um, there's the setting where either you have features that you uh, observe for the future, so you know what they're going to be, or those that you don't observe. For example, if you're in retail, a very important feature is whether it's a holiday or not, or um, how many days are you from Christmas? It's like the most influential feature in any retail marketing is how many days till Christmas and what's the day of the week. And so this feature, for example, uh, you, uh, you know in advance for all eternity. Other features might be you want to um, predict like how many people are going to ride the subway based on the weather. Excuse me. Someone's called spam call. Great. Um, uh, based on the weather. And so for the weather, um, you don't actually have the weather in the future, but you could try to do a forecast. And so you could think about this either having having the features for the future or not having the features for the future. And these are like slightly different tasks that require slightly different models. So you should really think about first, like how is this going to be used in produ uh, production? What is my uh, real goal here? Which features will be available to me and which features will not be available to me? Um, and then finally, another thing that's uh, a quite common task is classifying time series. So here this is um, the profile of different uh, appliances, how much power they take, and you can um, basically characterize and see um, what did someone just turn on by looking at how much power their, their, um, uh, their house draws. And so here you would have a time series and you want to classify a time series into one of several classes. An application that you're probably maybe more familiar with is um, like sports tracking devices. So your Fitbit probably can figure out uh, if you're riding your bike or if you're walking or whatever you're doing. And basically it takes a time series of uh, the sensor measurements and it tries to classify this into one of several activities. And so here the output is not, again, a time series. In the other two examples, the output was a time series, or three examples. Here the output is just um, a class label that labels the whole time series or part of the time series. So in these settings, sometimes there is um, a notion of a unit. For example, if you try to predict something that sort of makes sense on a daily basis, you might have a time series of length a day and um, you can say like, did this event happen? Or like, did this person go to work that day? And um, as a very clear time unit. Otherwise, say in this setting where you look at power consumption or in the Fitbit, there's not really a time unit. You don't really know ahead of time how long the activity will take. You don't, know, like, it's, it's not like each hour you decide, this hour I'm going to run, this hour I'm going to rest. Um, and so in, to 
for time series classification to apply standard models, you would have to create a fixed length time series. And so either your application has that in some way, or you would use windows. So you could uh, uh, say, okay, for every 10 minute window uh, of activity recording that I have, I wanna decide which activity is this. And then you can slide this window over the whole day, either overlapping or non-overlapping. And this is how you would get like a fixed length uh, time series to do classification. If you have a fixed length, then you could just basically ignore that this was a time series and just use it as a feature vector and put it in your random forest or your neural network. But to do that, you first need to, um, yeah, need to create a fixed length representation. So before we go into some of the forecasting, I want to talk a little bit about some uh, pre preliminarities and like just munging the data with pandas and how to work with time series data with pandas. So the main thing you want to think about first is um, are your measurements equally spaced or not? So in statistics, equally spaced is a time series and unevenly, unequally spaced is a point process. I think in data science, people call both of these time series. Um, so basically, one would be I have a measurement that is every second or every day. And so for example, your Fitbit probably records in a regular interval. And um, if you look at, say, stock on like a normal stock ticker, it will um, give you a new price at regular intervals, if you actually do like very high frequency trading, you don't like a trade might come in and then you wait and then a trade comes in. So there's not actually evenly spaced signal, but there are several times where something happens. And these two things um, require quite different processing. So here there's like two classical examples. So on the left hand side, you see the CO2 measurement data and uh, which are evenly spaced. Um, I'm not sure. I'm kind of switching between having a re resolution of a month and a week. Uh, I think, oh, this looks like a, a year, a month resolution. Yeah, year to month. And then the other one is the death of people by um, volcanic eruptions. So the, we, we have basically the same times, uh, time axis, but uh, Volcanic eruptions don't appear at regular intervals. They appear at some point, and whenever they appear, we get a measurement of, in this case, how many people got killed. And so most of the tools we will talk about uh, today assume that you have an e uh, evenly spaced time series. There is tools specifically to work with unevenly spaced time series, but the thing that is most commonly used in applications is sort of to just average them. So you could average, you could ignore that they're separate events and you could just average over a bigger unit like death by volcano per year. And um, then you'd have an equal, equally spaced series again and you could apply the same tools. So there is th things to um, work directly with point pro processes, but we're not gonna talk about them. All right. So let's do some uh, data loading with pandas. So here I'm using the uh, CO2 data uh, from the volcano and that's as a CSV file on some FTP server by the government and uh, it has some terrible format so that's why I um, give it all kinds of options, has the wonderful NA value of minus 999.99, uh, and the first 49 rows are comments and, gar and garbled. Anyway, so this is the, the data on the server. So the main thing that we wanna look at is um, CO2. This is the measurement in points per 
the in parts per million. And then um, the other part that's sort of most interesting to us is year, month, day. These three together encode the date. Pandas actually has a lot of tools to deal with dates because dates are really, really annoying. That's one of the annoying problems that Pandas tries to solve. And so we can just um, tell Pandas to parse dates. Usually parse dates, you can give it a single string column and it'll try to figure out what is the format of the date here. But you can do even better. In our case, the date is spread across three columns, year, month, day, and we can just pass all three columns here. And so, so the parse dates is a list of columns that I want to parse as date. And so I could have multiple columns that I want to parse. But here uh, I give as the first element a list of three. So it knows to, that I want these three to be combined to a single new column that is a date. And so that's called year, month, day. And um, so you can see here now, this is actually in, uh, this is uh, weekly space data. If you want to work with time series in pandas, you should um, usually convert it to being time series uh, indexed. So in this case here, I will set the index column to be year, month, day. And you can see now that before the columns were just numbered, sort of the rows were just numbered, and uh, now the time is actually the index, and so there, the year month day is now the index, and th there's no numbers anymore, but just values for different times. And so this is usually the first step in dealing with any time series data, is create a date time index. Then we can like nicely plot them. So um, this is just calling plot, and if you set the date time index correctly, it will um, give you the right axes and the right labels, and everything is nice. I'm like, oh, this is not the plot that I wanted it to be. That's uh, that's sad. Hmm. Okay, never mind then. Oh, maybe it is. Um, so, yeah, we already saw it's uh, weekly spaced. Actually, there, there was some missing values that I can't see right now, but um, there is 20 missing values. And uh, so we could train like an imputation model or we could impute with the mean, but actually um, for time series, a very common way to fill in missing values is uh, using forward fill or backward fill. So here I'm using forward fill that says, I will just replace each value by, each missing value by the value that there was before. Forward fill is a little bit safer than backfill because uh, backfill means you leak information to the past and so if you then try to evaluate your forecasting system, you might have like given it information from the future. So that's why I'm using forward fill and so I replace it and so afterwards I have no NAND values anymore. I'm not sure if I, so f for the time index is your question. So y we assume that all of them have the, are the same index. So they're aligned time series if I have multiple of them. So um, if they're not aligned, we can either use interpolation to align them or um, we can downsample them so they are on the course of scale. So if one thing I have a measurement every four hours, the other one I have one every 24 hours, I can just upsample or like uh, average the four hour one so that both of them are on 24 hour scale. So the usual thing would be to like fiddle with your data in some way that um, uh, all of your measurements are on the same time scale and they're all evenly spaced. And so, I mean, the more obvious thing is aggregate things 
to the most coarse level you have, but it depends on what level you want to make uh, a forecast. If you need to um, make a forecast every four hours, then you need to think about how are you going to uh, work with the one where you only have 24 hour measurements. This is actually something that uh, came up in, the, in my last capstone project where we had to do exactly this. Cool. Oh yeah, so here, here you can see how you do a resampling. Um, so if, for example, if they're on different, uh, on different time scales, you, um, Pandas makes it very easy to resample them to the same time scale. Here on the right, you can see a table of the different frequencies that there are. MS means months start. If it's capitalized, if it's not capitalized, it means milliseconds, which is not confusing at all. Um, and so you have business day frequency, uh, calendar day frequency, week frequency, and so on. And basically, uh, so here, before this was on a weekly basis, and so I resample it to month start. Uh, calling resample is actually um, lazy, so this doesn't do anything, but then if I call mean on it, this is like, like the group by, for example, basically you can think of this as being a group by operation, then I can call mean on it, and it will give me the mean for each new, um, for each new time window, and so here, they will all start with the month start now. And so we'll have the mean results over the month. So that, that, that's when you want to go from weekly to monthly or daily to weekly? Like when would you need to uh, resample? Yeah, I mean, if you want to go from one frequency to a different frequency. Okay. Um, and uh, like, which is a very common operation. So l let's say, someone gives you data and uh, like your Fitbit tracker probably does like ev something every millisecond or every couple of milliseconds and that's probably way too fine and you don't really care about this and so you want to aggregate it to get a more stable result and a result on which it makes more sense to learn. Okay, here's just an example of the different, uh, like the, uh, the same CO2 data set so originally data was weekly, and then I aggregated it to yearly, and to three, which is AS, an, uh, a annual start. And um, I can also have like uh, numbers here saying how many of them. So this is like resample to a frequency of three years. Um, so it start every three years. Yeah, so I mean, I'm not entirely sure if I get the question right, but um, so if you see here, th there's a very strong, in the weekly data, and there's a very strong periodic pattern, right? And then the yearly data is completely gone. It's completely smoothed out. No, no, it's just averaged. So the, the, the periodicity, as we will see in a second, is actually, it's a yearly periodicity. It's like the, seasonal trend and so if I average over a year then it's gone so yes you can lose a lot of information um, depending on how you resample but it also depends on um, what time span you're interested in so for example if you look at any data about like any retail or people moving around in the world, um, how many people are at a given place, then uh, you will see very strong daily patterns because people sleep at night and they do stuff during the day and they go to work in the morning and they come home in the evening. And so you could try to model this, but you could also have very strong weekly patterns uh, because people do things differently on the weekend and during the week weekday. And so, if you just care about weekday versus uh, weekend, then averaging everything over the, on a single day might be fine. 
There's a lot of structure in it, but if you don't care about the structure, you can average it away and it can be uh, sort of easier to model. Okay, so I'm going to go all, I think we're only going to do 1D forecasting and do only very basic things, and then I'll give, I'll show you how to go further from that. So the first thing that classically in statistics you look at in time series is stationarity. Stationarity means the mean, so it's a statistical notion that says the mean is independent of time, the variance is independent of time, and the covariance between two observations k steps apart is independent of time. Basically it means you have a process and the process doesn't really change over time that much. If you look at, um, at this, it's very obvious the mean changes over time. The mean over here is very different from the mean over here. So this series is clearly not stationary. And for a lot of the uh, tools, making it stationary uh, would either help the tools or makes the analysis more easy to read. Um, the, the second thing that is sort of very basic tool, um, apart from looking at stationarity, is looking at autocorrelation. Autocorrelation says, um, Basically, how much is the um, series correlated with the series with a given like? So for example, how much is each day correlated with the next day? Or how much is each uh, Monday correlated with the next Monday? So you have um, a, what's called a lag, which is a step size, basically says, I'm looking at observation this far apart. How, f how much are these are, uh, correlated? And it's called autocorrelation because it's correlating within the same sequence. And so here you can see basically these are S and T would just be um, two different uh, time points. So usually you aggregate the, this, um, so here it says expectation, but you aggregate this over um, all possible time points S and T that are a certain distance apart. Here for the time series, for COT time series, you can see the autocorrelation on this original time series is very, very high. It's like very close to one. So calling the, this is, PPM is the PANDAS series. So I'm calling autocorrelation on the PANDAS series. And um, by default, it just gives me a like of one. So this says, for each measurement, how correlated is it with the next measurement? And it's basically perfectly correlated. Um, look at, compared to the overall variant, variance of the whole series. If we look at other lags, for example, 26, if we look at a uh, lag of 26, then we see the correlation is uh, strong, but much less strong. And if we look at the correlation of 52, then we see it is again pretty high. Um, why is that? Yes, it's the yearly periodicity. So this is weekly data every 52 weeks of the year. And so this is this, the change of season. So if you look at the same week, um, a year apart, you're going to have very, uh, very correlated observations. Um, we can look at the autocorrelation function which is a function of the autocorrelation, sorry, which is the autocorrelation as a function of the lag. And so there's um, several tools to look at this. Um, I'm using statsmodels.tsa. Stats models is um, a library that's with like a sort of related scope to scikit-learn, but it's more deals with statistical analysis. It's less focus on out of sample prediction, but they have some time series analysis in the TSA module. And um, so that, that's what, uh, some of what we're gonna use. We're gonna use stats models and we're gonna use pandas. Uh, where pandas only has like pretty simple filtering functionality and stats models has some uh, modeling. 
All right, so here I plot the autocorrelation, and um, you can see two things. One is um, the autocorrelation is very high, and the more, the further you go away, the more it drops off. But even as a lag of 100, which is means 100 weeks apart, there's still a very high autocorrelation. And you can also see that there's like a repeating pattern that matches the repeating pattern in the original data. So here you can see that there's some sort of peak around 52, which again shows us that uh, there's this periodicity. Yeah? Uh, how do you like the parameters? Do you mean they happen to be statistics that they didn't do anything for that? No, lag, lag is the units are just uh, time steps in your series. So your series is it uh, assumed to have um, equally spaced steps, and then it uses the time index. Is it because that was the distributed uh, with the different rows? So it kind of I mean, it just, it just each, each row is one time step, right? And so the lag is in units of rows. And for our measurements here, each row corresponds to a, a week. But basically, I mean, you, to do this, you wouldn't, don't need to know the timestamps. You just uh, work on the rows. Pandas also has an autocorrelation plot. This actually goes over a much wider range, um, and it shows you this band. Basically, autocorrelations outside of these bands are significant, and um, it goes over like a huge range of values. Um, And you can see that it actually goes to zero at like, oh, this is, I'm like, is this the same time series? Yes, it should be the same time series. It actually goes to zero at like uh, 800. So this is still weather data? This is still the CO2 data. Okay, so this is this, this guy. Okay. This is how much our planet is in great shape. Um, I was thinking about doing uh, ice on the ice caps, but uh, then I didn't have time to do it. So I'm wondering why the autocorrelation would turn negative at some point in that context. I'm not sure why it turns negative. And yes, it's a good question. But I, don't, I think basically, but looking at autocorrelation this far ahead doesn't really make a lot of sense and it might be an artifact. So I would only look at autocorrelation for like things that are sort of around the periodicity that we expect. Um, and so that's why I prefer this plot because uh, it shows us what's actually going on. So this might be artifacts of, because if, if you like it by such a big amount, then uh, you lose most of the data. Just a wild speculation, could it have something to do with uh, regression to the mean or something like that over longer, longer periods of time? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> okay, so that that was the original time series. So now uh, I said we can detrend. Uh, sorry, we want to um, make the time series stationary because it makes it easier to work with in many settings. Uh, there's different ways to try to make a time series stationary. The um, simplest one is. Um, Differencing. So if you want to detrend, detrending means remove the change in the mean. Um, the definition of stationarity was re we, the mean is independent and also the variance is independent. So as a first step, we would try to make the mean independent, and so we would remove the trend. So the trend is how the mean changes over time. And so we could detrend by modeling the trend. So we could see, like, for example, we saw it's pretty linear. Maybe we can try to fit a line to the trend. Um, the other way is differencing, which means that we're basically computing the derivative. So we define a new series, uh, x hat, that is x t minus, you know, minus 1. So now I'm looking at the change of the value for each time step uh, with respect to the last time step. And so now, so you can do this very easily with calling uh, diff. 
in pandas. And now you can see that there still looks to be some structure in the data, but at least the mean is um, basically constant zero. So we remove this big trend that we had um, by only looking at the gradients. Wait. Oh yeah. So um, now I'm looking at the autocorrelation of the uh, difference series, and you can see that, um, well, this is with the very large legs, which I don't find that informative, but if you look at smaller legs, you can very clearly see this peak here. So before we had this wavy thing that goes down, but now we can see the auto after the differencing, the autocorrelation is uh, about zero most of the time, but there's a clear peak at, um, at 52. And so um, this would be a way how you could find out the periodicity in, your, uh, in a time series. So if we didn't know that we had weekly data or maybe we didn't know that um, it was a yearly trend. So you might not necessarily know what are the trends in the data. Um, it makes sense to me that there's a yearly trend in weather data because you know, that's how long it takes to go around the sun. And, uh, but you might not be aware of what are the trends that you expect in your data set. And so using autocorrelation plots in particular, on um, the detrended uh, series can help you figure out what are uh, these things. And here, this is like very clean because this is uh, like a very nice toy example. Um, in reality, it might be not, not as nice, but it's um, definitely a helpful tool. So uh, actually, in, in my last capstone where we did time series stuff, we found out that uh, oh, we, they gave us data from some wind turbines, and uh, we found no autocorrelation, even though it was supposed to be multiple measurements uh, a day. And so there was no correlation over days, like over the day, and no over the year. And so basically, looking at that, we knew it was the, the data was not whatever they told us, and it was completely unusable because uh, weather data is supposed to have something to do with the sun being up or not up. And so if you don't see correlations over night and day rhythms, then something is clearly wrong. So if the question is, if you have one year of data and you shift it by a year, what data do you use? You, you can't, you can't co um, compute autocorrelation that, that w wide. So here I have like many years of data. So shifting by year is very easy. And this is why I don't like this guy under, on this so much because um, the further you shift, the less data you have. Yeah. But usually I'm only interested in shifts that are much smaller than the data set I have. Because I can only, I can only detect the periodicity um, if I'm observing it several times. If I w want to see, if, is there a yearly pattern, but I only have one year of data, there's no way I can really tell if it's like, going to be periodic or not. So usually the lag is, sort of, yeah, is, is smaller than um, my whole series. So I mean, you can go back. Wait, where is it? So I have, what, 40 years of data. So I have, there's a lot of overlap. Okay, this is just the example um, of autocorrelation on the original data and on the different data. And it's much clearer sort of uh, what a periodic pattern is. Once figured out there is a periodic pattern, um, one very common approach to start with something is what's called a seasonal model. And um, Stats model has a very simple seasonal model built in. This actually doesn't really use any sort of machine learning or anything like that. It um, just uses smoothing. So basically, it tries to express the model, oh, sorry, the, the prediction as the result of something very smooth and something very periodic. And so here, 
you can see what's called the trend and uh, the trend is um, basically just a very smooth version of this and then the seasonal model is a periodic uh, signal that is uh, on on the yearly basis and um, if you add these uh, these up you get the original um, minus this. So this is the residual which is not explained by the trend or by the seasonal component. So this is interesting because it allows us to see, I mean, the original data was very easy to like look at, but it allows us to see that the trend here is much, much bigger than the seasonal variation. So the change from the beginning of the data to the end of the data is here from like 300 to 400 while the seasonal changes are only between like minus uh, two and two. And you can also see that the remainder that's unexplained is mostly much smaller than the seasonal change. So after you take the trend into account and you take the seasonal component into account, then the, remainder, the remaining variation is very small. Like there's some peaks here Okay, but generally, it's mostly a sum of these two things. So this, is, this tells us it's a very easy to predict series in a sense. Okay, but, yeah? Um, you could imagine also a case where you have multiple seasonal uh, developments at the same time and uh, potentially, you know, a lot of them. Um, Way or? Okay, the question is, what if there's multiple seasonal components? And I'm actually not sure if the stats model seasonal decompose allows for that. We'll later look at um, Facebook Profit, which is a thing that Facebook put out as open source. Uh, that definitely allows that. That's actually basically meant to deal with the situation. Um, also it fits it in a much nicer way. So here, this is actually, this is just running filters. This is not really learning. And uh, I'll talk about uh, something, actually learning something in a little bit, only vaguely. But yes, if you expect there to be multiple seasonal components, then um, it might be a good idea to try to model them explicitly and use this information in your modeling. All right, but before we do that, I want to come back to um, trying to build a very simple model that's actually sort of more a statistical or machine learning model, not just smoothing. The simplest model that people use is uh, what's called an autoregressive model or an autoregressive linear model in this case, also called AR model. Um, uh, so an order k AR model is given by this equation here. And you can think of it as you're predicting the time step x at t plus k by using all the values between um, at, from x t until x t minus k. OK, this is again, this should be x t minus k. And I'm again blaming the uh, TAs from last year for dropping the, sorry, the plus K here, plus K minus one, sorry. This is X T K, sorry, X T minus, pl T plus K minus one. So basically you have a sliding window of size K and um, you take the K previous time steps as input features. And for each of them, you have a coefficient. And that allows you to basically um, uh, learn the linear model on these features. And you can do, for example, linear regression. And you could do this if you, if you really wanted to. You could like, reshape something with, uh, reshape your time series and use scikit learn, but that would be kind of a silly way to do it. Um, so we're going to use um, sets model as uh, AR model. So the stats model API, I don't actually want to discuss in too much detail because I th 
well, personally, I find a little bit confusing, and uh, I'm not sure you're actually going to use it in practice. Um, but I think it's uh, good to walk through this example uh, to understand the basics of this autoregressive modeling. So here, I'm fitting this autoregressive model. I give it like here we give the data in the constructor, not in fit in sets model. Um, and here I'm actually using monthly data to make it more confusing. And so I take the first 500 month and fit the AR model. I, I fit it with the maximum lag of 12. So this is a order 12 autoregressive model. And then um, this is the coefficients that are uh, learned. So uh, we have a constant, then we have L1, L2, L3, and so on. These are the coefficients for the last time step, the time step before that, the time step before that, and so on. So you can see, basically, we, have very, we basically copy over the last time step, and then we make this adjustment using the others. So this is like by far the largest coefficient. And then I can um, predict. So here I'm predicting on uh, the index. So on the other, the index is the time from uh, the 500th step until the end of my time steps. And so you can see here is in orange what the predicted model does. And you can see it actually captures both the trend and the periodicity quite well. You can see the periodicity sort of becomes um, a little bit too small, and it overpredicts a little bit. But this is a linear model that has um, these 13 coefficients, or like the one intercept and 12 coefficients. So this is a very small, very compact model, and uh, it was able to learn this reasonably well. The reason why I picked max lag equal to 12 is because, um, so here I'm doing this on monthly data, so the periodicity is um, is 12, and so if I want to learn about the periodicity, I need to be able to look at at least 12 steps back. If I try to learn the, sa the same model with a max lag of 6, that doesn't allow me to model periodicity, like it doesn't, the model doesn't see the thing going up and down at once, and you can see it basically completely fails to, to model the periodicity, uh, correctly, and so, okay, maybe the predictions for the first couple of steps are okay, but then it uh, completely goes out of whack. The question is, um, or the comment is, it seems you need the periodicity to use the AR model. Is there a way to figure out the periodicity automatically? I think usually people look at the autocorrelation plot to figure out the periodicity. Alternatively, you could also just grid search the, uh, the max lag here. And you can see that actually, if I give it like two years, it actually does better. So with, uh, if I give it a window of two years, it, basic, it nearly perfectly makes, uh, predicts the next like 50. So I learned it on the data uh, from 84 to 99, and it was able to basically perfectly predict until um, like 2016 or something with using 26 uh, coefficients. So that's, I mean, that's kind of nice. Uh, in the real world, it doesn't usually uh, work that nicely. Um, oh yeah, so autoregressive model is sort of the, the most simple model. There's um, a slightly more advanced model that people in statistics often use. It's called ARIMA, which stands for autoregressive, wait, the, the I stands for integrated and MA stands for moving averages. Uh, autoregressive 
model with integrated moving averages? I'm not sure. So basically what it does is it um, works on the differences. So the I basically means that uh, it does differencing before it does modeling and it tries to model the trend using moving averages. Unfortunately here, um, I played around with the, uh, with the ARIMA model in stats models. I didn't really get it to work, but then I'm also not very uh, well versed with uh, autoregressive models, so I might have been doing something wrong. Or there might be uh, some, some things particular to this implementation. I'm not sure. But so basically, if you get any time series task, the first thing probably to do, well, the first thing would probably be fit a line, and the second thing to do would be run an autoregressive model, and the third thing to do would be uh, run an ARIMA model. So just to show you a slightly different approach, I want to approach the same thing with uh, scikit-learn. So the first thing I do is like it's kind of silly, which is I um, oh this is I think I think I'm using deprecated uh, a deprecated syntax here, but it doesn't matter too much. I think this is not allowed anymore. Um, so I'm taking just the index series. So X now will be my uh, will just be the date, and I encode the date as Unix time, uh, so second since 1970 something. And I split it the same way I did before. And so the, what I said, the th first thing you should probably do is just fit a line. So that's what I'm doing here. So this is kind of a silly model. The input is just the timestamp and the output is uh, the, the target. And so this model only has a coefficient and an intercept. So I'm only learning two parameters, and these are like global parameters. And so if I fit this model, I, uh, I get a line. I see the line is not very good. I include polynomial features, and I see, oh wow, the quadratic model actually fits the trend really, really well. Um, so the trend is basically quadratic, and uh, so I could, if I'm only interested in the trend, I could use that as a model. I could also alternatively, as I said, uh, I could use this to detrend the data. So instead of differencing, I could remove this and uh, then model the, peri the, peri the periodic uh, part separately. So here is um, the uh, just the periodic part after detrending with um, a, a quadratic model. I also tried um, doing an autoregressive model after I detrended it. So the autoregressive model um, is the same model I did before with a max lag, max lag of 12. So now I'm only using um, Um, so, so now I'm, I'm using the same autoregressive model, but um, I removed the trend before I built the autoregressive model. And you can see that here, basically in terms of the trend, this mo the, the new model that is the combination of this trend model and the autoregressive model is kind of better. Um, and does it doesn't over predict or under predict, but in terms of um, capturing the the periodicity, it maybe doesn't do it as well. Yeah, let's skip that. It's not very interesting. Um, I mean, okay, basically what I did was um, you can also try to do piecewise linear regression. So I added a couple of features. So here I added uh, the month as a feature and then something that's quadratic in the month be able to fit uh, a linear model to the month, and it doesn't really work very well. Um, but if I actually, um, wait. 
Oh, sorry. So this is um, a linear model where I have allowed just a quadratic model on the month. Here I have a one hot encoder of the month. So now I have um, one different offset for each month, which basically allows me to uh, model the trend explicitly. So basically now I have a coefficient for each month in the year and I have a trend model and that allows me to um, uh, model everything pretty well. So this is the uh, LR month that, that is a quadratic model over the whole time and then an indicator featured for each month. Um, so why did I pick month? I could have also picked week, but um, basically I wanted something that models, models the periodicity. So if it was a weekly periodicity, I probably would have picked uh, the day of the week. And so this is a model now on, um, well, I guess on 13 features basically, or if I have quadra uh, quadratic features on 14 features. So th in a sense, this is a slightly different approach to the autoregressive model because I explicitly tried to create features from the time series. Uh, one was just modeling the trends and the other one was um, creating features explicitly about uh, for each month and um, that allowed me to get the that. And this model now would make it possibly easier to add um, other outside information like events that I know happened. Like you would have holiday information in retail, for example. All right. So you can also use autoregressive models that are not linear models. It's actually something that's very commonly used are um, using trees. There, okay. Whenever I made the slides, there was a pull request on scikit-learn that probably no one looked at in the last two years. So maybe don't use that, but you can very easily implement this yourself by creating your own training data set where the training features are um, basically the last k time steps and the next time, time, time step is what you want to predict. And you can use uh, trees, you can use gradient boosting, you can use random forests instead of using a linear model. And um, that might give you uh, more powerful models. And you'll also be able to do this not only on the same time series, but you can have explanatory variables. So if you have like four time series, you're trying to break one of them. Um, for like k, you would have k times four input features and one output. So this kind of windowing is a very, very common approach. And the more powerful your model is, the better, obviously. Well, if you have enough data to learn it. All right, so, so we saw kind of two kind of families of models. One is the, the autoregressive models. The other ones are basically you have gl global features. Um, as I said, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, FB profit, which, is, which also uses global features and um, basically tries to explicitly do um, periodicity on different scales. Like, it's a little bit unfortunate there's not a lot of tools for doing time series in, in Python. So um, stats models is probably where most of it is, but stats models is not that actively being developed. Um, FB profit, I heard mixed results. So uh, it looks like Facebook put a, a bunch of work in it. It seems pretty, uh, Interesting from a modeling perspective, I think it mostly works if you have like seasonal data that is like user data or sales or something like this, then I would probably look at that. Um, so they use a linear growth curve um, and tries to like, or try to do build a piecewise linear model. They have yearly and weekly um, components, so the yearly component is using free features, the, season, the weekly is using dummy variables as I did for the month, and then you can have built-ins or either provided important holidays. 
So here you can see this is all really um, basically aimed at having daily data or interday data. If you're looking at like uh, millisecond data, this this is not really what you what this is made for. Um, just not tuning any parameters. This is what uh, it gives me. Uh, you can see that it actually models it pretty well, but the trend sort of uh, it leaves it in the end. I guess this, the problem is that it's using a linear trend model, where actually we would need a quadratic trend model. What's nice is that it gives you some uncertainty. So here, this is the training data set, and you can see the model of the training data set, and then you can see the further we get into the future, the more uncertainty um, you get from uh, every profit. So it gives you a probabilistic forecast that tells you, okay, this is the mean, but I also have a variance, and um, in some application, that's very useful. Um, you can also look at the um, particular components of the model. So here the model detected that there's no daily trends or weekly trends, but there's uh, yearly trends. And so this is the yearly trend that fitted. I think this might look a little bit won wonky. No. I guess this April is down. Yeah. Okay. I guess it's just a little bit noisy. So this is what it the uh, yearly model that fitted, and this is the uh, seasonal component. You can see that it's a uh, piecewise linear uh, trend, and uh, it has some uncertainty over here. So this is probably where we start, and this is um, actually where I'm going to end for today. The um, two things, if you want to go beyond other regressive models, and we want on seasonal models that you should look into are uh, Gaussian processes and recurrent neural nets. Uh, and they are actually, they're sort of quite different in where they are applicable. Gaussian processes are helpful, uh, maybe one second, if you want to, uh, if you have like small-ish data sets and you care about making very uh, precise predictions and possibly you know a lot about the data. Gaussian processes give you a lot of control over how the data is represented and what kind of periodicities you have and so on. They scale very badly to large data sets, so if you want to fit it on like 100,000 points, um, you're kind of out of luck, depending on the model. Like there's techniques to approximate it, but if you get like the Gaussian process from scikit-learn and you try to fit it on 100,000 points, it's probably gonna crash. Um, on the other hand, recurrent neural nets and LSTMs that we talked about very briefly last time, um, they, you can use them on arbitrary large data sets. The larger, the better they work. Uh, they don't really, you don't really know what's going on inside, so they're kind of very black boxy, and they're a little bit harder to understand. And yeah, if you don't have a lot of data, they'll probably overfit or you'll not be able to learn them. Again, sort of uh, stories from um, past capstone projects. Like everybody loves to do neural networks, so everybody jumps to using uh, LSTMs. And uh, I think like several weeks into the project, after people were trying to make the LSTMs work for uh, a long time, I finally convinced them to run a single linear ridge regression, which did, did much, much better. Um, so really, always start with the simplest model you can think of, try to debug the simple models, and uh, then potentially go to more complex models. Like making LSTMs work is still sort of a little bit tricky, and uh, as you saw in the uh, homework, there's lots of decisions you can make in like, how do I pick the architecture, and like how many layers, how many units, whatever, and so um, starting with linear models is definitely easier. Okay, the question is, what if you have multiple time series and they're lagged with respect to each other? Yeah. And I guess it depends a little bit. So usually I would align them 
um, but it depends what happens at um, test time. Do you have, like, at what point do you have them? If um, there's like three measurements and when I have the prediction, I have the measurements um, for two of them from right now and the other one, I only have the one from last week because it still needs processing. That means I need to be able to make a prediction using the one from last week, right? And so I guess it would depend on that. Uh, I would try to think about what will the setting be in which I um, apply this. And you need to model it in a way that you have all the information that you need to apply the model w when you want to apply it. I mean, it will probably be, it depends on the model, whether the model will be able to figure it out, but I mean, like if the lag is long enough, uh, if the lag that you give the model is longer than the lag that's in the data, then it should be able to figure it out. Um, but it will have less, less data to work with in a sense, and it has less recent data. So if it makes sense for your application to line it up, I would line it up because it, I think it would make everything easier, but it might not make sense. Like it might not be possible to line it up. Question is, have I tried adding interaction variables to Facebook profit? The answer is no. Um, and I'm sure you can. So like in terms of first time series data, like using a regression model instead of a recurrent neural net, is that just like ignoring the IID assumption and like doing the work that I'm trying? Um, so what I, um, I guess, it depends a little bit what the rich regression model would be. Like the question was about how did I design the baseline model and uh, how did I deal with the data not being IID? And so here, for most of these, for, or for this data set, I didn't actually have any input features, right? The input feature was just the time, which was like just equally spaced. So basically, my input was like A range. Uh, and so I just used a single feature and um, I guess, yeah, you could say I ignored the I, that it's not IID. Um, in the splitting into training and test part, I took care that I don't like leak information from the future. But so the, the very base model would be just the one feature that says, what's the slope over time? So just treat time like a normal. Yeah, just treat time like a normal. And that's like, that's like the, the most silly thing to do, but it's like the, I mean, that's what I did here. Here, I just treat time as a feature, and then I treat time like a feature with a quadratic uh, thing, and it actually, this is a very simple explanation, but it ex explains the trend really well already. Um, and so I like it because it's like, I understand entirely what's going on, and so that's good. Um, and then you can add, if you have periodicity, you can add in features um, that help with the periodicity. So like, what day is it, or what month is it, or something like that. Other questions? All right. So that's it. Um, and I'll probably be uh, posting the practice exam later this week. <laughs>